Good morning. Can I welcome members, officers and the public here in the gallery or watching on the webcast to today's meeting of the Budget and Performance Committee. Please make sure that your electronic devices are switched off or to silent mode to avoid any unnecessary interruptions this morning. And can I start by asking our clerk, Paul Goodchild, if any apologies have been received? Yes, Chairman. Um, apologies for absence from Assemblymember Russell, uh, for whom Assemblymember Polanski is attending as substitute, and apologies from Assemblymember Deval, who Assemblymember Moema is attending as substitute. Thank you, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out at item two and ask if any members have other interests to be clear? Noted. No, thank you. Can we confirm the minutes of the Budget and Performance Committee held on the 15th of June 2021 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. Can we note the completed ongoing and closed actions arising from previous meetings of the committee and additional correspondence? Noted. Agreed. Thank you. Can we note the action taken by me as Chairman of the Committee under Delegated Authority, namely to approve the response to the Chair of London Legacy Development Corporation, which we know as LLDC, relating to correspondence regarding the Committee's report, LLDC's finance during the COVID-19 crisis? And can we also note the response received for some, from Sir Peter Handy, the chair of the LLDC? Noted. Noted. Thank you. So we now move on to our main item of business, which is a discussion on the implications of the Mayor's budget guidance on the GLA's core 22-23 budget and the pro proposed budget process. So I would like to welcome our guests, Mary Hartley, who is our chief officer, David Bellamy, who is the Mayor's chief of staff, Richard Watts, the Mayor's Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, David Galley, Executive Director of Resources, GLA, and of course, Enver Enver, Assistant Director of Group Finance and Performance for the GLA. Welcome all. Um, I'm going to start with the questions this morning and they're on budget guidance. So I suppose I will go straight to David, I think, on this. How have you reached the assumptions that underpin the Mayor's central scenario? Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the, um, I guess the important thing to say is that, firstly, as you said, Chair, these are scenarios, not predictions. And clearly, you know, after the 18 months we've all, we've all been through and the you know, position we're in in terms of spending review and the lack of medium-term certainty about funding, it's a hugely uncertain position. The um, central scenario is underpinned by a view of um, um, an economic recovery in London that, yeah, notable from the situation that we were in, but certainly not to levels of um, you know, overall economic activity and business rate growth that we've seen in previous years pre-pandemic. And so in that sense, that's assumed that the economy will be in a, a baseline position in terms of the business rate system. And we've also adopted um, the billing authorities view on um, council tax and where, that, where at the moment they expect that to come out. Okay, and who have you involved in developing these scenarios? So in terms of the, um, the, the billing data, um, that was based on the latest information we had from the surveys undertaken um, by London boroughs as billing authorities and London councils um, coordinates that work. Um, of course, um, our senior finance officers have relationships with their counterparts in the boroughs and so you know, there are uh, assumption discussions and so forth there. Um, in terms of the economy, of course, um, we have GLA Economics who we engage with. And then um, finally, um, the scenarios were shared for comment with the chief finance officers of the functional bodies to get their, their expertise and input. Okay, because you're calling them scenarios, not predictions, mm -hmm. um, does that mean that you think that they're less robust? Or do you think that your scenarios um, uh, have been tested and, and they are quite robust. I, I'm not, if I'm, sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean by robust. I think I, can we rely on them at all? Right. So I think what we're 
what we're saying is that this is not a situation where one can say, if X happens, then this will be the amount of, the amount of money we receive. If Y happens, this will, this will be the amount. Clearly, um, yeah, the, number of, the number of variables out there and unknowns is, is very significant. And yeah, the three scenarios, therefore, represent a, you know, a range of possible scenarios. Um, I think yeah, it clearly is possible to take a view that, for instance, is more pessimistic. But, you know, like say there was a new variant of COVID-19 with all the negative economic impact that could have. But, you know, given that the government would, as we've seen, you know, need to act in such a situation, it's probably a very un unlikely scenario. And so we think, yeah, you know, we do we do think that the um, the range we've got uh, in these three scenarios does capture the picture, but also the uncertainties that we still face. Okay, so what what do you think is the variation in cash or income terms between the pessimistic, uh, central, and optimistic uh, scenarios? It's um, it's round about um, three hundred million pounds between pessimistic and optimistic. Okay, because I don't think that's in the budget guidance, is it? I would have to read the budget guidance to check, but that's... Um... Okay. Is it in the budget guidance, David? Um, the, the overall totals are in the uh, budget guidance, and I think we've also provided some high-level information to you um, on, on the, the range of scale. I think what I just also add to what um, Chief of Staff has, has said, um, I think on, on the plus, um, the range of, of 300 million, um, I think it's important to recognise that on the downside, it is based upon us being at safety net, and it feels quite hard to think that we would have a worse settlement, although, of course, that you know, is always possible, as David says. On the same side, on the upside, um, given the present state of the economy, and obviously we, we hope there will be a, a level of recovery, but I think the, the upside obviously assumes that there is a... Uh, a degree of recovery over where we think, you know, where generally the economy seems to be headed. So I think the, the range of that 300 million, I think, encompasses um, a, a range which allows us to be confident that we will fall within that range when we come to the final numbers in February. Okay. I mean, I don't know about my colleagues, but travelling into London this morning, I think we've got cause to be optimistic. We're stuffed into the Jubilee line like uh, sardines, so that's good in its own way. I think we, we, we would all hope that's right. Well, uh, absolutely. Yes. TFL certainly will be. Uh, Chair, oh. I can give you the figure if you're interested. I just received it this morning for yesterday. The tube, over the course of the day, the tube was at 58% of expected passengers and the bus network was at 71%. So that's uh, good for the buses, 58 They must have all taken the same train as me then. <laughs> <laughs> Entirely understandable, Chair. Still, things are improving, which is always a good thing. So what are the key factors driving the uncertainty over council tax and business rates income? I, mean, I guess overwhelmingly, it's the um, the, the economy. Um, we know that the, for instance, the furlough scheme is coming to an end. Now, um, of the to give you a, an example of its importance to London, of the ten parliamentary constituencies in the country that have the highest proportion that use of the furlough scheme, nine of those are in London. So. Yeah, the, the impact of the ending of the scheme is going to be quite significant and you know, we work to see how that plays out. Also worth saying um, that over one in six Londoners are on universal credit. Of course, there's a political debate at the moment about the level of universal credit. Um, but you know, there are clearly some, you know, with costs increasing in, you know, around food and um, utilities, as has been well discussed in, in the media this week, there are clearly you know, some real financial challenges facing Londoners, which could potentially impact on ability to pay um, council tax bills. Um, yeah. In terms of business rates, there is clearly the uncertainty around economic activity and um, you know, clearly London um, has an important importance on international tourism, which is not, you know, we're still not seeing. And there's a question as we kind of 
yeah, building authorities, I guess, forecast to next year, that's a really important part of um, you know, the central London economy in particular, and that is clearly uncertain. And of course, the, um, the business rates um, totals overall are underpinned by government funding allocation decisions. And as we know, we have the comprehensive spending review um, and then subsequent funding allocation decisions coming up. And so they will, they will play through into the level of business rates. The, the, the employment market's quite good, though, with, with jobs. So let's hope we can get more people into work, which is the aim of the game. Absolutely. I know that, and it's better for people to be in work, uh, as we'd all agree, I'm sure. Um, at 2.4, the budget guidance mentions several potential changes to local government finance, particularly those around business rates. What discussions have taken place with MHCLG regarding these reforms and adjustments? And, uh, Chairman, we've um, obviously been um, involved in the consultations um, from the government have set out on business rates. Uh, some of them are technical, some of them are more high level. I think perhaps the key thing um, is the uh, government's looking to review business rates quite generally. Um, and obviously we hope there'll be something um, in that in the spending review announcements, but it's obviously unclear whether that will be the case, because uh, obviously there is a great fear that the reforms the government might introduce would obviously then have a major impact upon uh, the mayor's receipt of business rates income. Uh, but obviously we respond to a number of the technical consultations. We responded, for instance, to the consultation we had recently around um, how, how they treat some of the, the telecoms networks, for instance, which um, uh, the government are proposing to kind of pull back under their wing rather than within um, the local areas. So there's a whole series of work that we do uh, regularly with MHCLG on that. Okay, and what sort of representations have the mayor, has the mayor made on well, these? You know, clearly, the mayor is, as always, looking to uh, ensure there's a degree of um, understanding in government about the need for devolution of a higher level and around the recommendations of the London Finance Commission. Uh, and again, obviously, they'll be part of the, um, the work that will be included in uh, the, the uh, CSR submission by the mayor. Has he actually written or done anything like that in the meantime? Because it's vital, really. Well, uh, I think we'll probably come on to this as a, a series of questions, but yes, I mean, obviously there'll be a submission that the Mayor will make uh, on behalf of the whole group um, to the spending review by the end of this month. And of course, yes, the Mayor has been you know, responded to the, um, the various consultations that have, have taken place on business rates. Yeah, And indeed, of course, as you would expect, um, um, he was actually due to meet the former Secretary for MHCLG in that meeting um, uh, had some concerns on the diary clash and then obviously there was a change in personnel as well as the um, change in um, department name and um, obviously he's writing to Michael Gove as the new Secretary of State and he's hopeful of um, meeting him at the earliest opportunity. Yes, it's very important. I hope he does. I'll, I'll still call it the MHCLG. I, I was on a meeting chair yesterday with some civil servants, and um, for any Prince fans in the room, they um, referred to it as the department formerly known as. <laughs> <laughs> I will try and do that, David. So, so you know, like sure the consensus, I... a cross-party consensus will emerge at least about what to call the department. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as we understand what I'm asking yeah. and I understand what you're answering, then we're all right, aren't we? Um, how are the GLA and functional bodies adapting their processes to deliver the budgets for the coming year, given the level of uncertainty? I think obviously the budget guidance has you know has asked them to make their submissions on the on the central scenario, but to do work um, to you know to understand what would happen if we were in a, a better or a or a worse position, and um, I know um, Enver and his team meet meet regularly with them to monitor their process, and uh, yeah, the, as I think in general organizations work internally on their budgets from kind of you know late july august september and then you know i imagine i'll be having discussions with them in october and you know one of the things that we will be looking to understand is right the the what ifs if if you know we don't have the level of funding that um they would anticipate now it may be that if we get the provisional settlements in december that will provide one degree of certainty one way or the other and give us some time to react. 
Um, but of course, with the, um, the billing authority returns only coming out end of January, start of February, yeah, that, as we know from previous experience, leaves us very little time to react. And so, you know, it's about um, understanding as much as we can at this stage about what's possible, whilst recognising that the range of outcomes that we face is um, is significant. Because, you know, if there's one thing, the budget guidance possibly in that range doesn't really capture, and it probably can't, is the outcome <coughs> of the funding negotiations for Transport for London and the level of um, support the government is, is going to provide. And clearly those are very large numbers indeed, which the Mayor um, won't have the, you know, just will not have for us a simple arithmetic fact, resources to compensate for if the government you know, provides lower levels of funding. Okay, can you clarify why the Local Council Tax Support Grant, and I'll call that the LCTS, has been separately identified in your budget guidance figures? Because this did not feature in the Mayor's final 2021-22 budget. So the purpose of what we were doing in the budget guidance was to try and separate out one-off income that was, that was explicitly allocated in the budget last year for... Um, one-off purposes um, so that the part one of the budget last year did set out all the additional one-off allocations that that were being made and that uh, you know 25 million pounds of lcts was being used used for that there were probably one or two other one-off allocations that were coming out of council tax or business rate income and if it would be helpful for the committee to um, provide a breakdown of how we um, allocated those things between the different sources, I'm sure um, officers would be pleased to do so. Well, you've anticipated my next question, which was going to be, how's that been allocated around the GLA group? So if you could put that in writing to us, we'd find that very happy, interesting. Happy. It, it, largely from memory, it was um, the two component budgets of the GLA and the Fire Brigade. Right. But we'll, we'll set out precise numbers in writing. That'd be interesting. Thank you very much. Um, why are there differences for the 2021-22 figures in the budget guidance compared with the published budget? Um, for example, the uh, London Fire Commission was allocated an additional 7.1 million. Similarly, and this is the one I'm really interested in, the TfL has increased by 65 million. Now that was published not that many months ago, and you've added this 60, I think, 64.5. Uh, million to it. Okay. Um, right. I can see in the, uh, like I've got in front of me the budget guidance which says that TfL for 21-22 was allocated 1845.7 million. Um, part two. Do you have part two? I've got 1878.8 and the oh, budget okay. guidance. Can I defer to Enver, who's, who seems to have the document in front of me? So I've got the, um, Chair, I've got the budget, the final budget in front of me. On page 35, the um, table at the top has the breakdown, and those numbers are identical to the numbers in the budget guidance before you take the one off LCTS out of it. So um, all of the numbers in the first column in the budget guidance are identical to what was in the final budget. So, um, oh. um, on page 35. The published figures. The published figures on page 35, the numbers are identical. So, part two, page 35, I've, I've now managed to catch up with that page. So, allocation of funding sources over which the Mayor has direct control. TfL, total mayoral funding, 1845.7 which I think, it's checking same, back, same. yes, was the figure that we had in the budget guidance. So they, they seem to be the same chair, so maybe we can take that offline and understand um, what's been compared with what. Yes, because the latest is 1943, which is the 64. So, uh, 1943, uh, 1943, that's the, um, the current proposal, isn't it, for yes. the next year? Yeah, but for it's 22 different. 23. Yeah. That's different um, because we've set new totals for 22 23. 
So 21-22 is identical. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why such a short period of time after it was put out there has been changed again. Because the 22-23 is based on the new budget guidance, which we've changed the scenarios. So if you recall, when we were doing the budgets back in February, we were basing it on safety net. Since then, we've changed the central scenario to baseline, which is about 3% higher. So everyone is marginally better off, particularly those that have got a higher business rates level in their income. So it makes a bigger difference to them. So the 22-23 position for central scenario, which is what the budget guidance is based on, is better than the original 22-23 figures that we had back in February. So is it a source of a growth in funding? It is because the baseline position is better than the safety net. We've, okay. moved, we've moved to a slightly more optimistic position in our central scenario than where right. we were. Okay, all February. right then, I get that. If, if, if I'm still unclear, I'll write separately to you because it's a huge <laughs> amount of money and I just want to be clear. 3% three, three is about £100 million, pounds, the 3% movement across the place. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, we're trying to scrutinise and we are watching every figure, so um, we'll, we'll park that and if I don't... If I, if, if I can't get Gino to explain that exactly, then I'll, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Um, so what are your processes for in-year budget changes? How is the Assembly involved in that? Obviously, firstly, each body has its own governance processes around, around budget changes. Um, in terms of the, the funding allocation picture, um, Council tax allocations are fixed, um, except in exceptional circumstances, um, and the law sets out the process to be followed there, which involves the Assembly, just as the Assembly is involved in the setting of the Council tax each year. Um, business rate allocations are set by the Mayor through mayoral decision, which of course all mayoral decisions are reported to the Assembly in the usual way. And then, the, obviously, the other side is the Assembly's scrutiny role um, and the Mayor's Budget Guidance this year sets out new reporting expectations to try and improve transparency around where budget ch um, changes take place in, in year so that we get a clear review of that. Um, it was too late um, to have those in Q1 reports because obviously the budget guidance came out towards the end of July and Q1 reports, I suspect actually TfL might have produced theirs already by then and others were probably pretty far down the line. Um, but really, yeah, my, you know, my expectation is that we're going to see that come through in Q2 and we'll, you know, we'll give, give you and everybody um, greater transparency on, on those changes. Would welcome greater transparency. We never want to be in the position we were in last year, which was unacceptable to every one of us. Um, are you anticipating any in-year savings being necessary this year within the GLA specifically? So we are um, not anticipating the situation. Obviously, in last year's budget guidance, we had to um, yeah, uh, advise... Um, organisations to deliver in-year savings beneath their funding allocation because we expected that you know, some of the money that we'd allocated was going to have to be paid back to billing authorities. Um, given the prudent approach we took in setting um, the budget for 21-22 um, and you know, our adherence to, to baseline, we're not expecting um, that to be necessary. Of course, there could be collection fund deficits um, on either council tax or business rates and we've we've seen those in um, in in previous years and we but we'll manage those um because there'll be you have a scale that we expect we can manage those through adjustments to funding allocations so we're, we're not expecting to um, see the need to do that no chair okay why when comparing the 2021-22 budget with the position in the budget guidance, does the London Assembly have an increase more than uh, the rest of the GLA group for 22-23 at a time when the Mayor's budget overall is becoming larger and more complex? Okay. So, um, firstly, I might query the last part of, of your question, Chair. Um, 
I suspect actually the Mayor's budget, I mean, we'll see where we get to after spending reviews and so forth, but with the, um, the Northern Line extension, which of course was largely funded by, by the GLA, now complete, and um, with um, Crossrail heading towards the central section opening, I suspect actually what we'll see is the Mayor's overall budget reduce um, in, in next year, but we'll obviously we'll see the numbers as Ember and his team put that together. Um, the, in terms of what was done, um, we, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, clearly the scenarios um, that set out are indicative and are scenarios, and therefore you know, the allocations to each organisation are necessarily indicative. Um, the approach that was adopted um, was, in essence, to um, you know, increase each organisation's funding according to the um, mix of council tax and business rates that they received with an expectation of, in the central scenario, that there will be a higher percentage growth in business rate income than there would be in council tax. And so that would be um, to the benefit of those organisations who receive um, yeah, the higher, yeah, for instance, there are some like the development corporations that are entirely funded by, by business rates. Um, obviously, time will tell whether that plays out. And you know, what we decided to do was, because you know, to some extent, um, where the mayor and the assembly end up between the council tax business rate um, division, you know, there's, there's no real kind of hard science to it. And so we adopted the, um, the same methodology for both GLA component budgets. OK. I mean, the mayor set his budget for 4.9 million for the next couple of years for the mayoral um, office, the mayor's office. It, is it that likely to change in year? Is it likely to come down? So there are probably... Um, there are probably two variables that would affect the Mayor's Office budget specifically. The first is as we go through the appointment process into the new structure, um, and yeah, the new structure is not entirely identical to what was consulted on, but is very, is very similar. Um, so obviously we did listen to all the feedback in the consultation. but. Financially, there always was going to be some impact about whether people appointed into roles will be starting at the bottom of the grade, the bottom increment, or whether they're already working at that role and you know, at that grade, and so would come into roles at a higher increment. So there will be some impact there in terms of um, that side, that side of things. Um, the other variable, really, for the Mayor's Office budget... Actually, sorry, there are probably two variables. One is that the change in um, administ um, yeah, the move of our Ministry of Support staff and bringing them together with CMT didn't happen on April the 1st, as was um, originally budgeted. Um, it happened a month or so later. And so that meant that there's a bunch of cost in the Mayor's office for April 2020 that w wasn't budgeted for, but correspondingly, I guess, you know, some savings within the CMT budget, and it all yeah, matches up. The other consideration is that the Mayor's office budget holds a travel budget, particularly for um, the Mayor's overseas um, visits. And, of course, that's something that's not been you know, not been possible in the last 18 months and you know, it's the, the, you know, the nature and possibility for future um, overseas visits by the Mayor is something clearly we're, we're thinking about at the moment but clearly both with the progression of the virus in this country and what happens overseas there are, there are some uncertainties about that still. Okay, as long as it's transparent so we can actually have a look and to see if, if it does go down. It's not because a load of his staff have been moved yeah. into a different area, which gives him to look as if he's got a reduction, but actually yeah. the same people I mean, are there. It's dancing yeah, there's, around there's, there's nothing, Chair, from the consultation that, like, yeah, that then involved moving anybody out of the Mayor's office. And, yeah, in that regard, it's all as set out in the consultation. And we are, I know there's a meeting um, next week to try and look at how we move um, our finance reporting from the old mayor's office structure to the new one 
which we, you know, I think we, we give breakdowns of in some of our finance reporting, and I think that's a, I think it's a more transparent structure. So hopefully, you know, there's in, inevitable kind of, you know, consequences of mid-year adjustments, but hopefully when we get there, it will give a, um, a clearer, a clearer view. The trouble is, David, there's so much movement constantly. For those of us to try and compare with the year before or like with like is almost impossible because you keep changing or moving the goalposts. But we will keep an eye on it and we look forward to getting I mean, um, Chairman, more transparency on that. Chairman, if I might come in, obviously one of the things that um, you know, Mary and I have committed to is that we'll ensure that the report um, to this committee in November will set out the level of detail in the GLA Mayor budget and we will ensure that there is a degree of you know, clear explanation and transparency where there are movements on you know, all, the, all the key items in the GLA Mayor budget. Um, so we're very much looking to replicate the format of the GLA budget that we had two years ago, which sets out a level of detail. But obviously, you know, I am happy to talk to you know, your officers uh, to ensure that we can set out the information in as clear and transparent fashion as, as we can. Um, obviously, there's a level of balance of, of detail to uh, you know, get, get the, the content right, uh, but we'll welcome those conversations with you, your officers, to ensure that we can report at the level that you want. Good. I, I, I hear what you say, and I look forward to a, an era of proper transparency, which would be good for all of us. OK, thank you. So we're now going on to the budget process, and my colleague, um, Assemblymember Clark, is going to take the first couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. How will spending plans be flexed to reflect higher and lower levels of council tax and business rate income? Um, thank you, Assembly Member. I mean, I guess it's it's pretty much um, what you know what I said earlier in response to a, a, a similar question, is that you know we are we are asking each organisation um, to work and think about you know what they would do in terms of if if um, allocations were higher or lower, and you know then that's something that both you know. Yeah, the mayor will be able to take into account if we do find ourselves in an overall picture with more or, or less tax income then clearly the, the mayor will have decisions to take about how to adjust the totals and so you know those those discussions in terms of what the opportunities are and what the challenges would be um, would be something that would um, you know be able to drive that decision making thank you and how confident are you that the process you have established to review progress on the 2022-23 budget will be sufficiently robust to identify any emerging issues and variances? I mean, I'm, I'm confident in the sense that you know, the fundamentals of the process that we're, we're operating are the same as you know, they have been in, in previous years. And so you know, we will both... Uh, you know, um, Enver and his team engaged in the detail, and then as things start coming together, you know, I will be engaged with the leadership of each organisation on behalf of the mayor, and then you know, with reports through to the mayor and discussions with him. So, yeah, we have that basic um, framework in place. Um, David, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that from your perspective, or you know, potentially, you know, I guess, an audit of you, because ultimately they're the ones who have to, you know comment on the robustness of our processes? Um, I mean, yes, um, obviously we uh, will be expecting our um, accounts and the auditor's uh, judgment shortly, hopefully by the 30th of September. Uh, and again, obviously there's some commentary there around um, you know, how the external auditor views those, those issues. Um, but perhaps if I can just sort of compound some of the things that David has said, I think it goes back to the, the risks that we've identified earlier on, uh, which you know, are endemic, you know, the spending review, business rates review, um, the issues we've talked about um, earlier on, you know, mean that you know, our process needs to be able to flex as and when we have that information. Um, but again, as, as David has emphasised, you know, the, the key issue that I want to kind of leave with you all is that you know, ultimately the Mayor won't know the level of resources for next year until early February, once we have the billing authority returns, and that you know, makes our process obviously very tight, very difficult. Uh, it makes obviously the the final numbers you know subject to that occurring. So it does you know cause problems in the ability for us to flex the process, but also of course for you to scrutinise it. And it, could I add to that? I think what we're not going to do, and uh, and it's never been done before, and I, don't, I think it absolutely would be disproportionate to do this, is effectively draw up three different budgets based on three different scenarios. I think 
you know, we're planning on the central scenario, and obviously, if it changes, then we'll then reflect our time, you know, reflect changes in that budget. The mayor will have some decisions to make, either positive or negative, depending on what actually happens in real life. But I think the, the, the underlying underlying theme of all of this is the level of uncertainty that exists at the moment around the state of the pandemic, around uh, the comprehensive spending review, about how, how kind of high level political decisions around levelling up affect London, uh, around the TfL's budget, and a whole range of other challenges as well. That means I think it is uniquely difficult to predict in this year, in the 11, you know, 11, 12 years I've been setting budgets of this of this nature. There's never been a more uncertain year than this one, and therefore we're, you know, we are doing what we can, and we'll then adjust accordingly. As, can I follow up on a couple of those? Um, can you provide any information on the potential savings uh, that were identified in the collaboration? Uh, program. Um, so yes, I mean th w what we are um, and David and I are in discussions on at the moment is the idea about how we, yeah how we um, report better on the collaboration program and set some of that out and we're we are we're considering whether yeah, some form of annual report or something like that might be the best way of doing it um, or whether there's an alternate approach and so it's. Um, it's very much a, a live discussion at the moment. We've actually a meeting about it this afternoon. And um, if the committee has, you know, any any thoughts on particular things it wants to see, whilst recognising that some aspects of this can affect staffing or commercial matters, and there, are, there tend to be limits on what we can say publicly. But you know, we're we're actually keen to talk more about the work that's going on there. As we can bring it back to another meeting because that's interesting We've got to think outside the box really don't we um going on to um assembly member Polensky. Uh, david uh what are the key asks uh from the gla of the spending review um thank you assembly member um the um firstly it's just worth saying where we are with the spending review which is that the government's deadline for submissions is next week um, we've obviously been working um, closely, both you know, the GLA um, mail team, um, but also functional bodies with relevant government departments um, and yeah, helping input into their own submissions into the Treasury, which are already in. And we're now in the process of finalising our formal submission, which will um, go to the Mayor um, for final review and approval tomorrow and then you know, early next week into the Treasury. Um, our approach really has been to recognise clearly, um, given the events of the last 18 months and the amount of money the government has spent in response um, and the wider political climate, there isn't lots of new money available. And we've really focused on um, a few areas which would be um, Funding for London's essential public services. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about baselines in this meeting to date, but clearly um, the funding we receive at baseline to um, support whether it's the GLA or the fire brigade or um, you know, the TfL or the police are all absolutely um, vital. Um, delivering homes and tackling homelessness, where clearly um, the mayor is, is keen to do more. Um, Kickstarting the UK's international visitor recovery, which again we, we touched on earlier, the importance of that, um, not just to London actually, but to the um, national um, economy. Um, responding to the jobs and skills crisis um, that we, we face, and again um, we touched there earlier. Um, supporting regeneration and growth and you know a couple of key areas of london where we would like to see things you know we do think things could and should progress um, supporting the government and the mayor's ambitions around net zero and of course importantly protecting leaseholders caught in the building safety crisis so those are the essential areas that we're um, we're we're covering in our submission Thank you, David. And with the importance of the principle of transparency, when will this committee uh, have an opportunity to consider the GLA's case? So we will publish the submission, as we have done, we did last year, for instance, in the process that was then, then aborted. 
Um, we haven't yet taken a view, um, and we know we need to, on whether it would be helpful or counterproductive to put it into the public domain before um, the conclusion of the CSR process. But absolutely, uh, yeah, we will we will publish it, and it will be there for uh, scrutiny in the usual way. Do you know when you anticipate making that decision about whether this will be public or not? I mean, I guess we'll take that decision next week, given how the clock the clock. Yeah, we'll get we'll get the submission finished, and then yeah, as part as part yes. of, of that, we'll 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 take us. I guess Treasury officials might want to know whether we're making it public or not. So um, we'll we'll take that as part of the decision, as part of the submission process. Um, and presumably, will you be writing to the chair of the committee uh, with a copy of that beforehand? So um, yeah, we'll when we, yeah when we will work out the best way of publishing it, but we'll make sure you know when it's published, absolutely. Um, and how will the London Assembly more widely be involved in this process? Well, um, I guess what I'd say is that, firstly, the Mayor's submission is based on you know, his priorities, the manifesto on which he was elected, but obviously yeah, what all the things the Mayor does is influenced by the work of the Assembly and the, um, su you know, the suggestions that you make through your work. And so you know, the spending review submission isn't different from anything else in that regard, is that you know, where there have, have been ideas and points put forward by, by the Assembly through your work, that it's appropriate to include in this submission Given its, you know, given as I've said, the high-level strategic nature of it, then yeah, we would include them. And then, obviously, beyond that, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a matter for your your scrutiny role. Excellent. I mean, we'll come on to mayoral manifesto commitments later mm -hmm. on in the, the meeting. But of course, winning an election, I'm sure you agree, isn't then a blank check to, to not be scrutinised for for the rest uh, of the time. No, no. The mayor very much believes in scrutiny, as we said, Absolutely. and that's why yeah, we've published our submissions in the past and put them out there for scrutiny and we will do so again this time. Thank you. And how does the government's recently confirmed timetable for its spending review affect the GLA's 2022 to 2023 budget planning process? Well, I, mean, I think it's, to be honest, it's what the timetable is what we expected because we always kind of had to understand it. There was uncertainty about whether it would be a one-year spending review again or, or a three-year. And, you know, as the committee will have heard us say on previous occasions, we uh, particularly given some of the, the capital programmes we deal with, but also the need to plan ahead for things like police officer recruitment. You know, we really welcome the idea of getting into a, a longer term view, the way we've gone for the last few years with, you know, each year kind of coming to December and not knowing what the government had in store for us from April. Just, it's, you know, it's just not a good, efficient way to um, um, run our organisations. Um, where the timetable leaves us, of course, is, I think, so the spending review is necessarily, given the scale of national government, a relatively high-level thing, which will set out department expenditure limits and will set out clearly particular pieces of expenditure in priority areas the government wishes to talk about. So it may be that in that announcement, the Chancellor will say, OK, and right, we're making this specific funding allocation for this specific thing, whether that's in London or elsewhere in the country, or he might announce you know, a national pool of funding for a particular project, which we then you know, may be able to bid for. So that won't give us necessarily, unless there's a very concrete, specific announcement for, for London, um, that isn't necessarily going to give us any more certainty, but what it all gives us, as with the kind of, for instance, the expenditure limits for local government that we set out, is it, you know, and expenditure limits for the fire service, for instance, it all, you know, it's directional to where we will be going, and then we will be in the place we are always in, in um, December, waiting for the provisional settlement to see what the government intends to specifically allocate to us for, you know, funding in each of those areas and you know what is un what is unclear is you know it's a very limited time period clearly from the end of october until um yeah the government should from the findings of the hudson review publish the provisional settlement on about the 5th of december they they frankly fail to do so every year but you know and publish mid-december just before parliament rises but um you know, even so, it's a very limited time period, and you know, question you know, 
what, if anything, is the government going to be able to do to, convince, to consider funding levels for 22-23 in that period, or are they essentially just going to have to roll them over? And yeah, that, that is uncertain at the moment, and that's clearly one of the big key considerations. So yeah, when that provisional settlement is published, that, if you like, is when the spending review starts to become real. With the previous experience, having, you know, along with others in this room, be, being around this uh, road on repeated occasions, is that, this, is that there are then a series of further questions. So the government has stated an intention to look at the so-called fair funding review, which has been rumbling on since about 2017, which has the potential to be negative for Lon all of London's uh, funding for public services, both boroughs and GLA, but we've no idea whether that's going to be incorporated into either the spending review, although there's been signs it probably will be, but we don't know. Uh, but we certainly don't know whether that will kick in next year or in future years. And as David says, you know, the I think the latest we've ever seen this comprehensive spending review was the 23rd of December. And so after that, it's not really until that point that we are in a position to have any sort of sense at all, really, about what our government allocation will be for next financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, his submission last year was about £29 billion. Um, Do we assume it will be around the same this year? Um, I'm, I think it's very hard to do a comparison because it's, you know, particularly because of the TfL situation where we're really trying to ask for very long-term funding. There are also a number of things where we're looking in the run-up to 2030 and goals about net zero. And so I can't probably answer that question off the top of my head because I'm worried I might not be comparing apples with apples in terms of the, the time window that the expenditure falls out over. Um, but, you know... I, yeah, I've obviously set out the kind of the areas that um, we're, we're looking we're looking to cover. And, okay, that's the you know, problem we'll, we you'll have. Get, you'll get we're these never are, comparing there's an appendix with to the um, to the submission which sets out the financial ask in detail. So you'll you'll have good transparency about that when we publish. Okay, it, it'll it'll be considerably more than that though, because both of our growing ambitions are on net zero, but also frankly because of the TfL situation that didn't exist when the last one was written. So significantly more than twenty nine billion. We, we think that in London needs that investment in order to give us a secure public transport system. I mean, it depends. Well, zero, it, it, yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, again, it, it depends on the time window that you look at, yeah. because you know, if you were to look at it and say, well, look, we need a big long term you know, spending approach that then covers, for instance, the life of, you know, we've an approach that works when you've got a tube train that has an asset life of 40 years and all the net zero stuff to 2030, you'll get a much bigger number. If you focus it on cash out of the bank in the next three years, then it probably isn't going to be over 29 billion. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, like I say, it's hard to compare apples with apples. Right, okay, well... That's not very clear, but um, so it could be a lot more than 29 billion is eye-watering, isn't it? Um, we'll go now to uh, my colleague, Assemblymember Sir Hota. Thank you, Chair. Um, these are questions about the budget setting process of last year. Okay. What uh, have you learned from the 21-22 budget setting process uh, that could be used this time to improve the, improve the process this time? I think the big thing that yeah is a is a learning. I mean, we, we kind of we kind of knew it, but it became really clear, is that the way that the statutory process works is is incredibly unhelpful to budget setting, mm -hmm. and we find yeah we find ourselves in a, in a you know in a position today where you know as David says we're we're closing the GLA's accounts. And we still don't know how much money we received for the previous financial year. Yeah, which is when you think about it. I mean, yeah, with apologies to my um, colleagues who are accountants, it's quite crazy, really. Um, and yeah, as we, we've rehearsed already this morning, the, the uncertainties we face, and it's just very difficult to have a structured budget process, which ideally you know, you're trying to narrow down uncertainty and get you know get to a point at the end of it where you're absolutely definite. When, firstly, you know, such as um, David Galley said, such certainty only comes right at the end, and you've got real uncertainty until those billing authority returns come in. 
and then of course they are um, late, you know, they are all subject to adjustment in terms of what happens, and so again your income yeah, estimates you know, play out, get an update in a year's time, and then another update six months after that, and you know it, it takes two years for us to actually know what, what actually happened. And so that is really the kind of I think the key the, the key thing that we knew, but it's it's fundamental to the legislation around council tax and business rates that that's the way it works. So you know um, we will see where the government goes in terms of its review of business rates and how it wishes the tax to work. I think we think that there could perhaps be a, their, their focus there is much more on the people who pay business rates yeah. rather than the, the processes around those who receive it. But we, you know, we await um, the outcome there with great interest. And I think um, it's, it's widely recognised that one day in the future, the government is going to have to review council tax, given um, yeah, how it's based on valuations that are, what, north of 30 years old now. It just, um, you know, is a fairly um, broken tax. And, you know, the approach of, you know, pushing more and more costs of policing, for instance, onto it is clearly, you know... And social care. And social care is not, is not what it was it was designed to do and so we would hope that if the government does engage really for those things there'll be an opportunity to look at some of that process and try and try and improve it for all our benefits of course in your budget setting process you made certain financial assumptions mm -hmm. and, and if there's been an impact on those assumptions those changes to them how do you intend to keep the assembly informed of those impacts yeah so what we've done in the in the budget guidance for this year is to try and set out much more clearly where we are with each of our taxation income sources and the, the risks and uncertainties of affecting it. And you know, I hope that was helpful to this committee and, and to other readers. And what we want to do is take that same philosophy through other documents um, where um, obviously we do set out their concrete numbers, um, hundreds of pages of them, and we want to, yeah, we would just have to, yeah, review the detail of the commentary that we provide on those numbers to try and ensure that we're, um, you know, we're being as clear as we can be about the uncertainties we face. Okay. Uh, and um, just looking at the TFL budget assessment process, the TFL regularly sports a budget and forecast with a financial assessment of the risks and uncertainties. Do you think that represents best practice? I think actually TFL is in a fundamentally different position to any other organisation mm -hmm. um, because obviously they're so dependent on affairs as we know pre-pandemic their, their funding model was 72 percent of their income was coming from fares and so they were hugely exposed to a range of economic risks you know in the short term and in the longer terms in terms of the development of the city's economy mm -hmm. um, and that just doesn't apply to other organizations in the gla group you know where they are either funded by direct grant, for instance, thinking about the bulk of the Met Police income, um, or they're funded by tax allocations, which, you know, in practice are much more stable than where we can, where clearly where we can go in terms of um, ridership. Um, and we always have that short-term certainty that billing authorities will give us the money that, like I say, it's, they tell us too late, it's the, it's the legal process, but they tell us too late how much money they're going to give us, but when we do know we are going to receive that money. So, yeah, TfL is in a fundamentally different position to the rest of the group, and that's, that's why a, um, a different approach is taken. Yeah, but, of course, the, the, the question really is that, that they give a lot of commentary mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of uh, assessment of the, initial, of the assumptions they make. Uh, do you think that approach, uh, what I'm getting, does that approach make them more able to deal with uncertainties and is that a good practice? So given the risks that they face, which we've seen in the last 18 months, <coughs> come to fruition in a way bigger than, frankly, any of us I think could have expected, it's clearly absolutely right that they, they take that approach. As I say, you know, 
for the rest of the group is different because it is about either direct grant income from government or it is about um, council tax and business rate income. And yeah, we always have set out the risks around that in part two of the budget documents, one of the appendices there. I, th I think it's Appendix H, but don't quote me on that. Um, and yeah, we will we'll look again at how we how we structure that information just to try and ensure we're trying to we're trying to set out those those risks as clearly as possible. But essentially, they are the same risks that every other organisation faces. So it's not necessary, you know, for instance, for each development corporation to repeat them because you know they're no different for LLDC than they are for OPDC than they are for the fire brigade. So, so in your opinion, <coughs> the process taken by TfL is, is, is unique to it mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't represent best practice and doesn't need to be replicated by, by other GLA bodies. So it, I think no, it represents best practice for the situation that TfL are in, mm -hmm. yeah, which as I say is fundamentally different to the situation the rest of the GLA group is in. Yeah. If yeah, if the GLA group the rest of the GLA group was receiving yeah, the majority of its income from essentially commercial trading activity, we would clearly take a very different approach. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. It receives it from, yeah, directly or indirectly from government decisions with then a degree of variance based around, you know, precisely what happens with council tax and business rate income. And so it's a, it, we need a different approach to talk about these things, which is, you yeah, know, which is set out, as I say, in the appendices to part two of the budget documents. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, David, can I ask you at this point, can you give us an absolute commitment now that we will not see a repeat of what happened last year around the uh, business rate safety net with information that could have been included in the January budget, albeit with caveats, I, I accept that. Uh, we don't want things left out entirely. Do you commit that that will not happen this year? So I think one of the things that, yeah, I've, I've learnt in this job is that you can always think you've set everything out and then you find out that you haven't. I think there's, there's a point earlier about budget guidance where you're asking about the totals on optimistic and pessimistic scenarios, yeah? and yet maybe we could put a bit more detail in. And we know at some point where you know, we're writing these documents, they're getting, they're getting so big and there is a, you know, both a delivery time to write it and a reality about, you know, there's just, you know, you've got to draw a line somewhere at how, how much we put in. We did, um, you know, we broke last year, for instance, in the consultation budgets and the part two documents later, we broke the 100 page threshold, which, you know, has always been like we've set a hard limit to keep it under 100 pages and we broke that so we put in more detail. But clearly there's more, de yeah, there are things that were not in there that the committee, you know, Post process has said they wish they wish were there, and so we absolutely want want to try and do that. Um, but what I guess I'm just hedging slightly because, like, you never achieve perfection in these documents, and there's always going to be there's always going to be something that we think, oh well, you know, if only you'd included that, and which of course is partly the process of these sessions and why the committee is obviously always welcome to um, approach myself or officers and ask for further information. I can't believe this. We're talking about a hundred million pounds. We're not talking about ten and sixpence. We're talking about a hundred million pounds that was not put in there. I'm looking for a commitment from you that that will not happen again. If it's a small amount of money, there isn't anybody around this table that 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 doesn't accept small amounts of money. But a hundred million pounds just not to feature anywhere in that budget was totally unacceptable. But and you'll find that agreement in all parties. Can I have your commitment that that sort of figure will not be left out again? So the, the budget last year set out our best prudent expectations at the time it was produced of what income would be. Well, yeah, it will do so again. What we will, what we are, I'm happy to commit to do is, yeah, again, we will do the very best we can in in the budget documents to set out the risks and issues we face and the likely scale of, the likely scale of them. Well, I was all enthused before by the thought of transparency. The fact that you won't say, yes, Assembly Member Hall, we will absolutely endeavour not to leave out £100 million. 
this year or the like. I'm quite honestly appalled about, I'm sure my colleagues are. We'll go to the next questions with Assemblymember Fortune. Could I come oh, I apologise, Assemblymember Pigeon. Can I just pick up, maybe actually ask the same question to the proper officer, David Galley. Will you commit to not be putting us in the positions that we were put in last year? You are the proper statutory officer. Will you commit? The Mayor's Chief of Staff won't, but will you? Well, what I'd, I'd say, um, Assemblymember Pigeon, is that you know, I will continue to do my job to set out what I believe to be the best projection of the income levels. And I think it's important that the Assembly um, recognises that very small changes in business rates and council tax, what we said before, you know, a 3% change, which is well within the scope of what would happen, does lead to changes of £100 million. So you need to recognise the reality of the volatility that we are facing allied to the uncertainty. Now, what we will do, as, as Chief of Staff has said, is we will set out you know, that full position. Um, we will be, as I've, I said in a separate question, you know, we will work with you to be as transparent as we can around all these issues, um, but I, I will continue to set out what I believe to be the likely level of resources that the Mayor will have uh, based on my best information. Okay, so we won't be put in a position that we were put in last year because you will be clearer in the narrative. Well, you know, it, it is more than possible given the uncertainty, the volatility that we've described, that there could be major changes between the assumptions that we have made in the budget guidance to what will emerge in February. And, and that's just the, uh, the nature, the endemic structure that we've had and discussed. So, you know, it is more than possible. You know, we will make our best estimates of that as we go through the process. We will engage you, um, hopefully informally and formally, through that process. We set out the ranges of those possibilities. We'll continue to update that. And one of the things that, of course, um, you know, privately we have done with um, the Bureau of Leaders is set out, you know, additional information flows beyond the budget guidance to you to try and give you assurance that we recognise what happened last year and we will work to be as transparent as we can. But again, just to reiterate, the, you know, the uncertainty, the volatility means that we are in a situation which is likely could well lead to large changes from the numbers we set out in the budget guidance. But we will be clear what those numbers are. That's the point. Well, we will set out the full information um, that we can with the ranges and happy again to work with you as, as assembly members, work with your officers to ensure that we can be as transparent as we can. Okay, thank you. I, I suspect you're as happy with that answer as I am, <laughs> assembly member. Pigeon. Certainly wake me up for that question. So, yeah, yeah. This doesn't give us very much confidence in transparency, let me tell you. Um, we'll go over to my colleague, assembly member Fortune. Thank you, Chair. And, and building on what Assemblymember Pigeon and Sahota said, um, it, and, and David, you actually said that you would be willing to share informal briefings as well, because there are, it seems to be there are some challenges with this process, which I'll, I'll come to in a minute. But, and I think this is what Assemblymember Sahota was touching on about that sort of risk and opportunities that's analysed by, by TfL. It's ensuring that we have sight of some sort of financial risk analysis of the assumptions that, that you're making as well, just so we've got all of that information shared in these meetings or offline. You know, I've had a look through, as, uh, as David was saying, I've had a look through the appendices, I've had a look through the paperwork, and I think there is some work we can do to be clearer on that, that risk analysis. Is that something you can commit to having a look at? Well, as we've done, I think, yeah. again, obviously I don't want to say too much about the informal conversations we've had, but obviously we have written to, to you as the, uh, uh, your, your chairman around the uh, details underpinning the assumptions we've made in the budget guidance. So, you know, we are, we are happy to share that. I think it's important that we have that informal dialogue so that I can be clear on the additional information that you'd want and then be, be best respond to that as I can. As I've, as I've said, we um, absolutely want to look again at how that information is set out. So we do welcome that feedback. Um, it's just, yeah, we deal with, as David said, we deal with, with huge uncertainty and very small changes equal very large cash amounts. And so, you know, both through, both through the formal process, you know, when we get, you know, and also privately as we deal with the assembly as a body that has a budget, um, you know, where we get material changes into what we believe the outturn is, we will share those. Um, but 
you know, the, uns the uncertainty is something that we all have to live with and it's, um, it's every bit as bad for us as it is for you. So, so this, these questions are about lessons learned from that, that budget setting process last year. I, I wasn't here last year. Um, but I, I, I do sense there's some frustration and there's some, um, you know, uh, desire for things to be done differently. So, David, you have a, a silky verbal dexterity, but talk to me like a 10-year-old, right? What, what went wrong last time? What I want to do is look at a sort of map of what went wrong last time. What are the challenges we're expecting this time? What are we going to do about those challenges? How are we going to get in front of them? And how... How do we know that's happening? How do we check? That's what I'm trying to sort of map out. So what happened last time was that, yeah, the fundamentally, the um, forecasts of both business rates income and council tax income changed, yeah, for the better, um, late in the process when we were, you know, when we received the billing authority returns. The, uh, the other issue last time was the um, business rates pool. And so, yeah, the business rates pool um, was associated with a safety net within the business rate system of 97%. Now, given London's economy, We've never really worried about the business rate safety net before because the business rate system has, you know, for years, always been returning growth. But, yeah, what the business rate safety net was at 92.5% before the pool, and, yeah, that was the year in which, yeah, so the situation we expected for 21-22, you look at the variables again set out in the budget document, was the same as back then when the safety net was 92.5%. So given that the decision to withdraw from the London business rates pool had been taken since the provisional settlement, a prudent view was taken that we, you know, we could not rule out the government moving back to that lower safety net level. Just, yeah. just for me to and in the end, otherwise, they otherwise decided I'll, I'll not to do so. Mm -hmm. So, the two things we've got is the, the, the council tax income changing and that business rate pool changing. The, yeah. They were the two fundamental things that changed. As a result of that, was there anything else that was major that, that then disrupted that process? I mean, I think there were, there, were, there were probably lots of moving parts and uncertainties in terms of what additional help the government was going to provide, authorities, etc. I can't, I can't remember blow by blow, but I think, I think you've got the two big issues right, there. Okay. To, and to so talk then that about. knocked on with the reporting process, and then which had an impact on the scrutiny process. So is that, is that right? Well, I mean, I think the, fund, the fundamental point is, yeah, the inherent uncertainty okay. that. Yeah, it's only when we get the billing off. Yeah, it's only when we got the billing authority returns, and it's only when we got the financial settlement, both of which were in early February, we knew the outcome of that stuff. Yeah, ultimately, until you have that information, everything we're doing in every stage of the process until then is conjecture and based on best assumptions. Okay, so um, you know, reaching out for that old cliche of the definition of insanity, what are what we're expecting to happen? this year differently? What are the challenges we expect to see coming up this time around? So the, I mean, we don't have the issue about the pool because I don't think we're looking to uh, well, re-establish that. Yeah, the unfortunately there are, there are discussions obviously going on around whether um, London would want to continue the pool at the moment in this financial year, the pool is, is temporarily suspended. Um, so it's a decision that um, we as London treasurers need to make about the pool, which will add to um, you know, the complications here, um, but it would feel likely, given um, where we are with business rates, that overall London will conclude that we will not want to uh, re-establish the pool. So, subject to that discussions, I think we can probably assume that the pooling element will not add to the confusion and difficulties for the 2023 budget. Yeah. But, of course, you have, so you have confusion about the government's review of business rates, and, you know, if they decide that they're going to change the operation of the business rate system in some yeah. way, 
question whether they can do that in a meaningful way for 22-23, but if they were to decide to do that, um, then you know, that, that is clearly an uncertainty. Um, that's, that's where that get throws up um, for us to look at that financial risk analysis around any assumptions that we're making. So yeah. we've got the idea of what went wrong previously around those big ticket changes around council tax, around the pooling of the business rates. This year we're saying there's still some uncertainty around the pooling, so we can, we can feed that into the analysis, we can feed that into the information we get. Is there anything else coming up that we're concerned about? I mean, COVID obviously is, is, is always going to be a concern. I think it's the issues we've, we've talked about okay. already in terms of you know, the, the spending review outcome direct and, and consequent, you know, what that means for our baselines. Um, it's then, yeah, economic impact in terms of what happens with, with business rates and the income that comes from that kind of, you know, yeah. to what extent it deviates in either direction from so the baseline. Get... Um, and then similarly, you know, for council tax. Um, so I think those are the, you know, the big uncertainties and they yeah. play out both in terms of the 22-23 budget but also of course the medium term picture recognising that this is a three year spending review and it is uncertain as we said earlier in the meeting whether the government is going to try and really change some of the baseline allocations for 22-23 um, or we'll just put that in you know, okay. we'll do that in future the, the, the only thing I'd add to that if, if I may is that we talked a lot about the CSR and I think the risks from that are well understood. I think the other thing that there is in the ether is the Treasury's so-called fundamental review of business rates as well. As David referred to earlier, that's played through the prism, understandably, of people suffering from, businesses suffering from the burden of business rates bills, that, as we know in London are growing, you know, a lot. I think it is yet to be seen how cognizant of the Treasury is of the impact of business rate changes on the public services that are currently funded by business rates, because since the Osborne reforms, clearly business rates make up a very large chunk of local government funding. So, so we move to that point now then, in that journey I was talking about, which is, you know, what, did, what went wrong last time, what the challenges we see coming up, to talk about how are you getting in front of it, and then how will we know you're getting in front of it, how can we, how can we be assured of, of that, because that, that feels like that's some of the, the frustration or confusing in the room, is that these, all these parts were moving around, Kind of understandably in a way but then there wasn't that, that that conduit that information wasn't flowing through so how, how do we make sure that doesn't happen this time around in the budget setting process uh, i think i'm fortunate perhaps if I, if I can try and respond to that i mean perhaps it would be, be helpful that if i, I shared the information that uh, we sent to um uh, Len, Len duval as part of the bureau around the additional information that we wanted to um set out to you over and above the budget guidance that shows the information flows yeah that we, we've set out, so when the spending review comes through, what we would then do from the impact of the spending review. Um, and, and obviously happy to um, discuss that formally, informally with you, with your offices, whatever would work to actually overcome the perceptions that you've described here. Because um, I think it's really about information flows as far as I, as I see, see the issue. Um, and obviously we, you know, we are happy to work with, with trying to ensure that we can um, make those flows better so that you can gain the, um, the appreciation, the understanding of some of the, you know, the uncertainties, the limitations, what we can and what we cannot say, you know, the range of, of the possibilities. I think that's, that's really reassuring to, to hear that, that we get that commitment that that information is going to flow, you know, in whatever way those briefings want to, to happen because, you know, perception does become reality and, it, and it's our job to make sure that, you know, in our, in our roles as, as advocates and scrutineers for the people of London, that we're reassured that these things are being looked at. So. I, th I think having that would be uh, yeah. very important. Thank if, you. I, if I could just add two quick points. I mean, yeah, one other thing, yeah, question, can we take a decision as London government about the future business rate pooling yeah, ahead of the provisional local government settlement? Because if we were able to do that, that would, reduce, that would remove that uncertainty because we would then would ex reasonably expect whatever the government said in the provisional settlement to follow through to the final settlement. I guess we don't know yet whether we can or not, because it depends on some certainty around the business rate system, which obviously the government is fundamentally reviewing, and we await their outcome in, in the CSR, and we mustn't rush into something that would be financially disadvantageous to London if we got it wrong. But if we can do that, that would help reduce you know, a risk earlier in the process. 
unfortunately, the, the other stuff comes, you know, comes back to the point we've, we've hit <coughs> a number of times in this meeting already. It's the statutory process, and we don't know where we come out That's, until early February. I, you know, I, I get there are things you yeah. can control, there are things you can influence, there are things you have to accept. So, you know, mm. the things we have to accept, we have to accept. What can we influence? You're already talking about that, and we as an assembly can do that. What can we control? We can control those things that we can get ahead of with those mm -hmm. that, that information flow, which I think is really important. Especially, and sorry to bring it up, but over the next few months, mindful of the budget setting process last year and the fact that we're, we're out of the building and we're, we're scattered across London a little bit, that's likely to leave people a little bit discombobulated. Um, so I think it's really important that we have that constant reassurance and information. Thank you, Chair. Just a hand. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that's very helpful, David, what you said to in response. Mm. But I, I was sitting, just sitting, sitting here thinking, when does things start to solidify in the cycle? I, I mean, we are expected to approve the budget right for the mayor sometime in February. Will we know certainty by then, or is it all still up in the air? What's the time scale, timelines for this, please? So we would expect. So you know, we yeah. So we the government publishes the provisional settlement. As I say, the Hudson Review said that they should do it on the fifth of December, about fifth of December or thereabouts. They've never hit that. Um, it usually is you know, just before Parliament rises um, in kind of the third week of December. Um, it is a provisional settlement, so there's no there's no guarantees. Um, and you know, there have yeah, there have been occasions in the past where our officers have uncovered technical issues, and that has led to you know some some changes. Um, but that, that's a degree of certainty. But as you say, we don't get the fine. Yeah, last year, from memory, the final settlement was published on the 6th of February and went through Parliament on, I think, the 14th, actually. Um, and so you only get certainty there. On the council tax and business rate levels, you know, they shall be in by 31st of January, but they're not. Um, some of them are late, or some of them um, updated returns are received when billing authorities you know, either spot an error or receive additional information. So, yeah, we find ourselves getting the information. Yeah, obviously it varies depending on whether weekends fall in February. But let's say you know we've a pretty good idea of where we'll be by the 17th, and it's usually by about the 14th or the 15th we've got to publish the budget documents. So we have a week to go, you know, one week in which to go from, right, we now actually know where we are, to you know, understand the implications, put the options to the mayor and ask him to take decisions, and then flow that through, you know, 150 odd pages of budget documentation. Um, and so, you know, if it's difficult for, from a scrutiny perspective, I absolutely accept it is. It's an absolute nightmare from our perspective, um, too. And so it's only that really about a week into February that we, you know, we have that certainty. When the Assembly actually approves the budget, there is some, some certainty there that we're, we're not dealing with the figures out of the air. So you, you are dealing with certainty in that by then the government should have set the final settlement and the um, billing authorities have, in making their returns, have committed to the council tax and business rates they are going to provide. Of course, as we were saying earlier, that doesn't mean that that's what we ultimately will get. If, the, if for instance, not as many people pay council tax as they were forecasting, then we'll have some money in future to give back. And we, you know, we manage that usually through the, through the next year's process, unless you know, the potential variance, as, as last year, looks like it could be very significant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I, I'm going to say this because I think some of the answers, especially to one of my colleagues, was not, was not correct. And certainly, uh, Assembly Member Pigeon was around. To, to say that the, the picture painted around this pool is, is that it was all down to uncertainty and that the only, it was only uncertainty that caused the problem, and we're referring, of course, to that 100 million. What you're ignoring was the fact that it was left out of the budget in January on purpose. Mm -hmm. I have a letter from David Galley actually saying, I decided not to update the, the Mayor's first draft budget, 21-22, published on the 19th of January, for the following reasons. And one of them was uh, there would have been a significant risk that the impact of the proposed safety net had been brought into the mayor's budget at that stage and had been given 
public exposure, the government could well have changed their proposal. So in other words, we kept it a secret because we didn't want the government to notice. That's not about uncertainty. Mm. That is about transparency. Mm. And I'm really furious that you haven't answered some of the questions in the way that we would expect you to. We will take this up again, no doubt. And I obviously need to inform more recent colleagues of, happened, of the nonsenses yeah. that went on last time. Um, but in the meantime, I'm a stickler for timing and we're up to the time for our next um, session, which is mayoral manifesto commitments. This will be a joy. Um, Assembly member Fortune. Uh, no, I beg your pardon, it's Garrett. Me. Assembly member Garrett. <laughs> Do forgive me. I'm so cross. It's, it's only the second time in this meeting that someone's confused my name, so I think I might have to get a badge. <laughs> <laughs> So the Mayor's commitments, um, just as a sort of starter for 10, what is the total additional um, sort of budget impact of all of the very long list of commitments that the Mayor made in his election campaign manifesto? Uh, thank you. So we have now got a agreed list, and thank you for, to your officers for collaboration on that, of uh, 248 commitments, of which 184 relate to the GLA. Uh, 42 to TfL and arranged to the other kind of uh, uh, other functional bodies. I think, as we said before, we anticipate the vast majority of those are going to be paid for through existing budgets. But we are through the budget process. There is a single budget process for the year, and we are working through the budget process to definitively establish which of those commitments require some extra resources. We think we're currently in the ballpark of around 20 of the 184 GLA commitments that require extra resources. And though we haven't got a precise figure yet for how much that, that, we will publish that in November as part of the Mayor's draft budget. And I think it is safe to say the figures we're talking about are affordable for the GLA. You said 248. Of total commitments, yes, of which 184 it's just, it's just the, the GLA. Being the eager beaver I am, I actually printed out the list, and my list ends at number 243. So I don't know whether we have different lists. I think lists. from memory, Chair, I've not been involved in this process, but there are some that are like 147B yes. for <laughs> internal reasons like, <laughs> and not having been involved in the process. I, right. I don't even want to try and understand. For, but no. yeah, if you look at the, if you open it as a spreadsheet and look at the cell count, I seem to recall it came at 248. 136, for example. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Um, <laughs> So, speaking about the 243 or the 248 or whatever the precise yeah. number is, let's call it about 250. Um, so, so we the, the, the question that's written down here says we have a definitive list. Uh, apparently, it's been overtaken by events already. Uh, the the sort of definitive list that we have. Do you know how sort of item by item that it sounds? Which of those you sort of got allocated spend against, which you were saying is, is primarily from existing budgets? Is that right? So, so if we went through the, let's not go through all 200 and however many it is now, but let's imagine as a paper exercise you could go through or have gone through every single one of those lines and allocated where the money for it will come from, with the exception of I think 20-ish, you just said. So, is that the, right? no, I think that's, forgive me, that's not, that's not quite what I said. So, okay. what, what, we are doing that during the process of the budget, of this year's budget process, because of, you know, it's an incredibly complex process, so we've not run two budget processes this year, one around the manifesto and one around the rest of the budget. So that, that process is, is ongoing. What I'm trying to do is, in a spirit of transparency, tell you effectively where we are up to in that at the moment before we publish it definitively in November, which is we, our current thinking is there are around 20 of those commitments that will require extra resources above and beyond what's already in the base budget to deliver. Okay, so I mean, when people say allocate, you know, existing budget allocations, mm. presumably what that sounds like for people somewhere in the organisation is their budget's being squeezed to give some more money for somewhere else. Is that what no, that means? No, I think it means that quite so a the lot mayor's of budget is quite generous and he can just conjure no. up some extra cash. No, I no, I, that, that's no? not the interpretation I'd, I'd, I'd attach to it with, with respect. I think okay. what it what it means is there's quite a lot of what was in in the existing manifesto that. Uh, we are working on and is met from within teams of this existing budgets and work can be either changed or uh, developed in order to meet manifesto commitments. Okay. So of, I'm a bit loath to ask for the 20 because I think Susan, uh, the Assembly Member Hall will be on my case about time use, but if maybe you could write to us with the 20 that are still, or ish, 
Da, 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 that you're still well, I, I, think, I think I'm not in a position to do that at the moment. What we'll okay. do is set those out in November in the normal uh, procedure, of normal budget procedures. So if I can do a few, can I do a few spot checks? So uh, this is, I think, the third time asking about this. One of the mayor's commitments was about a city hall developer. Do we know anything about that yet? I've previously asked like a number of houses it might build or a budget it might have or a name it might have. Do we have any of that? So um, because I don't have advanced notification of, of some of your spot checks, I'm not in a position to give in, you in precise the third details time I've asked, so You could that. have guessed I might have come up uh, with that one. Well, <laughs> you know, I think the... Uh, with advance notice, I'm very happy to provide that level of detail, and we've got okay. some, of the, some of the precise, uh, more ex uh, expert officers around to support that. But on so on, on areas like that, it continues. What we said is we would launch a review of that, and that review uh, we are looking at in terms of the you know in, in to meet the manifesto commitments around a review of housing across the GLA group. And that we I think we haven't started yeah. that review so, yet, but it is ongoing. So, yeah, there are two commitments. There's the commitment around a review of how the GLA group um, does housing, and it logically makes sense to look at that before you start work on the City Hall developer. So we've had some initial discussions on the City Hall developer, but we're deliberately not charging into detail there because um, we have, you know, the... The independent review, which I'm hoping we'll be in a position to announce um, that fairly soon. So, will I know the answer in November? Then is that what you're saying? So, about just the outline of where that's going. So, the draft budget is is for you know is going to clearly set yeah. out our proposed mm. expenditure plan um, for you know all the commitments now. Not, not without talking about anyone specifically. Clearly, not all the 184 will be start work in 2023. Mm. So, some you know may wait at least in financial sense until 23, 24. Um, but you know, absolutely, you know, you'll you'll have in November um, both ourselves and all the executive directors in front of you, so you'll be able to um, you know ask questions about you know any manifesto commitment you wish to. Yes, there'll be indicative Thanks, allocations within that about what it what it takes to both fund the review and what you know best guesses about what might come out of it. I mean, I, I suppose you know the, the way that I think about it, lots of people went off to vote in May, thinking hmm. they were voting among other things for a mayor who might set up some of these these policy pledges. And I think people understand that you know by the end of May he's not already cracking on with some of them. Perhaps he has some of them, but it feels like you know we're. What, Four, five months on, nearly from when the manifesto, or from when he was elected, a bit longer than that, from when the manifesto came out, and, and and literally, there's not a single thing you can tell me about a commitment to set up a city hall developer. I mean, do you feel as no, no respect, respect? I think we've just told you quite a lot about the process to come to decisions about you've, the, you've, to meet the manifesto right, commitment. You've, I you've talk, you've talk I, about, so I, I don't take that as the question. So, so, so is it, but, you, but you haven't. I mean, you, you told me about a process yeah. to answer a question that, you know, was in a manifesto months ago. You have actually not even said whether it's a committed plan for 22-23? So, again, I don't, I don't know what I can add to my previous answer, really, that we, we there is a manifesto, which, you know, there's an election sure. which the mayor uncomfortably to deliver a manifesto, which includes a review, we set out a plan to do, do that review within the mayoral term. So we're absolutely yeah. sticking to within the letter and the spirit of the manifesto. Yeah. So, yeah. Clearly, of the manifesto commitments, some reflected work that was already, you know, was already budgeted and planned and is happening, and some of it was not. The things that are, the things that are not, unless it was appropriate in a specific circumstance to kind of change flight mid-year, then will come out through, you know, next year and the year after's budget. And so we are bringing the proper budget process, which is going, you know, is going through all of the manifesto commitments and looking at how we ensure they have appropriate resources on them and we will in the normal way um, you know, set out our draft budget in November we will at that point also try and provide some summaries so that you can understand right you know which of these manifesto commitments are included in the budget which are not and then we'll be we'll be able to have that discussion yeah it's a, absolutely a three-year manifesto and it doesn't follow that you know all that number of commitments we should be charging ahead with all of them in, in the first four to five months in fact i'm not asking you to charge ahead but anyway um, so of of the things that are already in the budgets of the of the 
the, the manifesto commitments that already have funded, including the existing budget. Are there any of those that you think that are unlikely to be delivered? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Um, and I suppose, coming, coming back to the original list, uh, this, this, this 243, 248, um, with the limited financial resources and with only a, a three-year term, um, how are you thinking about prioritising you know, what is quite a long list of commitments? Uh, I think, so, let's put that question up a number of different ways. I think, number one, it's worth saying that quite a lot of the commitments are around lobbying or around, you know, even some of the broad statements of value. So clearly they, just get, they get played through. So not all of those are a commitment to spend public money on doing a thing. Uh, after that, then effectively we're working, th the, the Mayor set out his kind of key five priority areas, which I don't need to rehearse because you, you'd have heard it repeatedly. Uh, and we are looking around what we can really do around the key issues around the moment, around environment, around economic and social recovery, around community safety, young people, and uh, affordable housing as the, as the key things. But the truth is, you know, they're all, we are confident as things stand we can deliver all of the manifesto commitments. So we're working through through the recovery missions and through the, the work of the GLA and with partners around the best way of getting all of those done. But we're cracking on across, kind of really across the board at the moment. So is there sort of a timetable of the, the pace of cracking on, which, which things we can see sooner rather no, than later? No, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any administration ever in the history of, of kind of elected politics has ever published a timetable at this stage of, of a term about when you're going to do the various different different things. And I'm not thought, sure we're going to break new ground on that one. But I think so. But you will get a sense from the budget of when, in the, when there are kind of budgetary allocations against each, each of the commitments. But, you know, these things will, will take place during the term you know, given what will inevitably end up being events that will in, that will play their part in that as well. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. I don't think we're any the wiser. No. Assembly member Garrett, very disappointing. Okay, I'll go. Um, I've got a couple of follow-ups. One from uh, Assembly member Polanski. Thank you. Uh, so my questions are partly about process. So if I take one example, SK90. Uh, this is the commitment for a zero emission bus fleet by 2037. Now, the mayor press released last week, and it's here as well, that he can you know, bring that forward by three years from 2037 to 2034, but with government funding, bring it forward to 2030. Now, I obviously applaud that and, and want that to happen. But how do you square that circle or, or navigate the difference between lo Londoners want and need for the climate emergency and what can actually be delivered when we don't know if that money is coming? What I guess we we'll say is obviously the point of the Mayor's manifesto was about making commitments that he believed he could deliver. Um, we've certainly seen you know, the industry and the bus industry is evolving at, at pace. And you know, the Mayor's announcement last week that you know, we won't buy any more um, but, but, you know, diesel or hybrid buses is another, given that London buys about half the buses in the country, is another very big signal to the industry that they need to get on and get on and change. Um, we have to, you know, clearly, like I say, the manifesto sets out what the mayor's commitment is. The mayor is always going to want to overachieve. It's in it's in his nature, um, and yeah, we will we we will just try and yeah keep keep yeah keep Londoners and the assembly updated as we make progress. Yeah, if yeah. Clearly, the funding around buses is a significant part of the um, spending review ask, and clearly, buses are very important, and London buses are a very important part of the gov targets the government has set itself. And so, we will continue to lobby, and we will see where we get to in the CSR. And whilst the mayor's overachieving in that process, how is that? <laughs> how is that recorded? Like, are there two different budgets? One where he gets the money that he's lobbying for and then it's worked out in that scenario and one where this doesn't happen, like how, how, how is that all set up? Well, the budgets are set on the expectation, on, on the income that we prudently expect to receive. So at the moment, what the mayor has said is that, right, we've got to a point where we can deliver this particular thing by 2034, yeah? And so the budgets that you will, you will see will, will reflect that, yeah? If additional funding comes forward, um, from the government that will will change that. Well, that will show in the budget, and you know we'll we'll say that we're now working to a, a more you know, an earlier date. 
Understood. Now, we've spoken a lot this morning about the cost of net zero, and you described it as, as a big cost and expensive. But is the case being made that actually getting to net zero um, has huge economic benefits? And actually, how are you setting that out in the budget, and are you making the case for that? So, I mean, the, sorry, forgive me as I drop my pen while I speak. So, first, completely agreeing with you, your basic premise that it is both essential for, you know, for you know, quality of life in the city, but also there are very significant economic benefits from it as well. I'm not sure it's necessarily, therefore, a case of how you put that in the budget, because in the course of two or three year budget, what it actually means for kind of limited public spending is probably not very much. However, in terms of the lobbying case we make to government, and frankly, out to Londoners as well. That's quite a big commitment, and it does come back to the work we're doing around Green New Deal, things like the retrofit accelerator we've just worked, where you know, we do know London has a lot of housing that needs insulating. We know that insulation creates jobs and cuts London's fuel bills, and we know it's extremely good for carbon emissions as well. It's a, it's a win-win-win across the board, and I'm not sure anyone in this room would disagree with that. So the question is, what can we do to both generate the funding and the market and the construction sector that can move at pace to insulate London's, London's homes? And all of those kind of things are exactly kind of what we're looking at at the moment in partnership with the boroughs who are the major homeowners in the city. And that you will see that work reflected in the budget. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the funniest comments so far today. Enjoyed that. <laughs> Assembly member Hirani. Thank you. I think uh, manifesto commitments have uh, been, been quite prominent uh, nationally uh, as well, uh, and we've seen uh, quite a few manifesto commitments broken around raising uh, national insurance and the end of the, of the triple lock. What lessons do you feel you can learn uh, to ensure that the mayor realises his manifesto uh, as well in, in, in light of what we're seeing nationally? I think lesson number one is you have to be serious about doing it in the first place, and we absolutely are, and hence, hence the rigour of the process that's being put in that you will see reflected in the, in the budget about going through, and members of the Mayor's office have ultimately reported to me working, working to make sure there are, uh, you know, the, the manifesto is, serious, is seriously implemented, and the Mayor himself, in all the conversations he has with, with colleagues, is absolutely clear that the manifesto is a, is a, is a contract with Londoners that's there to be, to be kept. I think number two is make promises you can afford to keep. And if we take the bus bus example, we want to get the electrification of London's buses done as quickly as possible. That's the basic premise we're working to. The manifesto was written at a time when we could be confident that could happen in 2037. We're now confident that can happen in 2034. And we're hopeful of bringing that forward. But it's, you know, it, the, the, the manifesto was written before I, I, I kind of joined the mayor's operation. It's, it feels to me a kind of sensible and proportionate deliverable document, as, as I've said. And I think the third is about the power of the partnerships it takes to deliver the manifesto. You know, the GLA is a relatively, is, isn't, has an enormously important strategic role, and the, the post of mayor has an enormously important strategic role in London, but actually we are relatively small players in the delivery of policy that Londoners notice on the ground, and I think therefore the work we've collectively done to strengthen <coughs> partnerships with the boroughs and with other, other key players in the business community and civil society, I think will absolutely pay dividends in how we deliver the manifesto. How will you keep the Assembly updated if it, if it looks like... You know, certain manifesto commitments may not be able to be achieved, or, or um, it, an example of bus fleets uh, may come earlier than expected. Well, you, you are at liberty to ask questions when, whenever you want, and if there are particular issues you want to flag as of particular interest, then we kind of can, can do that. Uh, obviously, the manifesto sets out the entirety of the aspirations of the mayor's office across all of the role of deputy mayors, across all of the committees of this. Uh, of, of this assembly and across all the work of the kind of mayor's team as the senior officers. So there are lots of opportunities to, to ask those questions. But as always, uh, with a little bit of advance warning, we're, ha yeah, we're happy to come here and account for performance, but deputy mayors are always, always happy to come and account for their performance against delivering their bits of the manifesto as well. Yes, I think the thing is we will ask the questions, but we do hope for proper answers. Assembly member Fortune. Thank you, Chair. Very quickly on SK92, which is about the expansion of the ULES in October 2021 in terms of manifesto commitment. Um, is that all still on track and on time? Will people, I think the date is the 25th? 
5th of October, yeah, yes, it, it is. So are there any issues around infrastructure, IT, cameras, expansion? So, I mean, it's, it's a very big, complex project, and people may think, well, it, it's, just this, it's just the same as the one we have. But, of course, you know, the area covered is, is 18 times um, the, the size. And so, you know, from an IT perspective, there are infrastructure changes that are you know, being rolled so out at the moment to address that. some of that verbally dexterous that. silkiness I was talking about. Um, is, it, is it on track? Sorry, I, I, said, I said it was. <laughs> apologies, I thought I said it was. Yes. Um, it, 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 it is. Um, but you, you were asking about about, about you know, some of the risks faced and you know so that is one of the things that's been dealt with you know, we've also had some issues um, around supply of steel for the sign the boundary signs that are necessary which um, you know, it looks like we've got through but you know that's an example of um, a supply so what chain happens thing if it's not ready because if you haven't got the complete camera coverage and there are big holes in that outer rim that's going to cause some real problems yeah. So we're not. So, like I say, we're 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 on track, and the work. Yeah, we are not anticipating. Yeah, it's monitored very very closely. Um, I yeah, you know, yeah. The mayor receives regular reports. Um, the, the relevant deputy mayors um, are all all over it. I know that the transport commissioner speaks regularly to the chief executive at Capita um, in terms of, of their aspects no of it. So it's yeah, yeah. It is monitored very closely. We're um, we're comfortable. As I say, yeah, there have been risks that we've been facing. We're 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 comfortable with where we are, and yeah. So we're we're expecting um, a um, a smooth launch on the twenty fifth of October. So there's, there's no red flags. There's 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 nothing. Yeah, there's no red no red flags to the um, successful delivery. No. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask you about any red flags on the budget for that? Is it on time and on budget? Um, I'm not aware of any, you know, it's a, a TfL budget matter. I'm not aware of any, any concerns on that, no. And can you remind me what the budget is for putting that in? Um, no, I'd have to write. I can't, don't have that on the top of my head. If you could write, because I'll, I'll be amazed if it is on time and on budget, but suitably pleased if it is, I suppose. OK, we're now going on to quarter one and... My colleague, uh, Assembly Member Pigeon, is going to lead on this. Okay, I'm going to direct my question to the Chief Officer to start off with. And if the Chief Officer wants to refer it to the Director of Resources, that would be great. I just feel I need a little change of voice, and I think um, David probably needs a break from talking as well. Um, so, uh, Mary, um, looking at the new um, performance uh, reports, why has the GLA stopped reporting actual expenditure in these quarterly monitoring reports? Uh, I am going to ask David to reply to that one, although um, uh, the intention is that we do from now on. Okay. David. Yeah, this really turns around the issue of us having this dual structure where we report by missions and foundations and we report by directorate. Now, one of the things that Mary says about the um, finance improvement programme is we're working very hard to introduce a new coding structure from the start of the new financial year that will allow this process to be automated at the moment. Essentially, it's a manual process, which is obviously time consuming and obviously potentially prone to errors and difficulties. So we are, it's absolutely vital for us that we report both by missions and foundations and by directorates and teams as how we manage the organisation. So the actual spend we can put through, you know, as now, will be around directorate and teams um, with high-level information being presented at missions and foundations. And that once we have the new coding structure in place, then we have that as a more automated process. Now, again, obviously what we will do as part of the November budget, again, as before, is to report again in that dual structure, so you will see both. But at the, at the moment, we, you know, it is a, um, a manual process that is causing us some difficulty and the resources to actually ensure that we can get actual expenditure reported by missions and foundations. So you've got a new coding system, I understand that, that will make it more straightforward. Um, that's when did you start that? No, that will, we're looking to introduce that from first of April. It's it's an extensive bit of work that we are undertaking. So the next financial year, so we won't have anything other than this red amber <laughs> green kind of information, rather than act, the actuals versus um, the budget. Well, to no, date. we will we will report actuals um, based upon directorates and teams. Right. And we will we will put that at a high level in missions and foundations. Um, so we will move towards that in the future quarterly reports and in the budget, 
but in terms of being able to have a, an automated process that would have um, it done at the missions and foundations at the level of detail for each mission and foundation and below that, that will be dependent upon the finance improvement programme delivering that um, change to the, the coding structure. Okay, so but for the time being, so this first set you've put out, we don't have the figures, they're only in the teams, as you say, rather than in this, this dashboard summary I'm looking at. Yeah, and what I would emphasise also is that um, from a management accountability point of view, um, I mean, clearly we still, um, the organisation still run around directorates and teams, albeit then we're obviously looking at that from the Missions and Foundation. So in terms of you know, the accountability of budget holders and holding them to account around their agreed budgets, then you know, we still have that um, rigorous process in the, uh, the quarterly performance reports that um, you know, Mary chairs with each of the executive directors and their assistant directors. So you know, the accountability for spend is very much in, is still in place around that directorate and team structure. The issue is more for me around the aggregation up and the detail behind missions and foundations which we need to work on. Mary, are you happy with this new quarterly monitoring report? So. Um, I think when I sent it to the Assembly according to the deadline, I said it was still work in progress. Um, we, as you know, you know, I felt very strongly that the performance approach should focus on the missions and foundations and core approach. That's taken some reorientation. Um, the quarter one dashboards weren't complete. Um, uh, we tried to focus on those uh, covering the majority of the spend and the biggest priorities. Uh, there will be a more complete set for quarter two. Uh, and, um, you know, as I said at the time, you know, I'm very happy to hear uh, what thoughts Assembly members or officers might have in terms of ongoing mm -hmm. shaping of those dashboards. So I think we did a pretty good job in the time we had to shift them to missions and foundations, I feel that's very important as us mm -hmm. an organisation to focus on that sort of perspective on, mm -hmm. on performance. Um, quarter two set will be better than the quarter one set. Okay, okay thank you. Um, David Galley, how close to the final outturn have your quarter one forecast been for the last, say, five years? Um, I mean, I need to go back to the level of detail to kind of give you that sort of analysis, but I think. It's important with quarter one to recognise the kind of limitations mm -hmm. on that, and I guess you know particularly in this in the election year, um, the sense in which you know obviously virtually half of the the time period is under the old administration. Um, so I mean, quarter one, you know, inevitably is you know, it's very early in the year, but I mean, obviously, uh, and people in terms of knowing what's really going to happen it becomes limitations on that. So you know there clearly are variations that emerge from. Um, Q1 being largely, not exclusively, because obviously there are some big variances that we reported uh, in, in Q1, um, but you know the big variances tend to then emerge later on in the year. Mm -hmm. So you know inevitably there will be variance between um, you know the agreed budget at the start of the financial year uh, and and the outturn. But again, obviously happy to do a bit more detail in terms of an analysis if you'd want between you know, that <coughs> level of, of variance. I mean it is an area that um, you know has been a preoccupation and an issue for me ever since I've been in in, in the GLA. Um, I think it's particularly around you know the nature of the GLA. Um, that a lot of our, our programmes have slipped, and therefore the variance, particularly on capital, um, you know, is, is, um, has been large in, in earlier years. You know, I'm pleased to say in, in, in 2021, we actually reported a Q4 a positive variance on capital spend, uh, which I think is encouraging. But it's one of the things that, again, you know, part of the performance work that, that Mary and I are working on is very much to instil a greater level of discipline around monitoring to get the variances closer to budget and you know, hold people more, more closely to the budgets that have been set. In your role, and probably Mary's as well, I'm sure you look at, across the GLA group, the different um, uh, quarterly reports. And which would you say, looking at them, represents best practice to you? It's a really interesting question, but if I take it and, and, and maybe Amber may want to come in. Um, I think all of them um, have got merits in them. I think we talked earlier about the TfL report um, in terms of the risk metrics. I think um, you know LLDC's report in terms of their looking at their commercial income. And they've all got um, you know different structures. They're obviously, they're all very unique and very different organisations. Each of the functional bodies has their own 
you know, particular needs to report around risk and, and issues and, and their structures. You know, OPDC, you know, is largely an organisation that is obviously waiting for a big capital spend to be approved, and therefore is relatively small scale. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we are very keen to do, and again, perhaps you know, Andrew might want to say a bit more, is actually look to standardise mm. the mm. group-wide reporting process and learn some of the uh, the best, best lessons from those, say, the you know, TFO risk reporting as we discussed earlier. Um, I think some of the the issues on LLDC's report around commercial income, I think, are very very telling as well. But um, I don't know, Andrew, whether you want to say a bit more about Mary. Do you see these? Did you want to add anything? Um, I, I, I mean, I do see them. I have to say, my honest answer is I'm entirely focused on my own organisation mm. and are, um, uh, you know, providing quality reports. That that's what keeps me occupied in the run up to each of these. Um, I have looked at the others. Um, like I think everyone said, there are good things to draw in, in all of them, uh, and I, you know, personally think there would be some value looking across and deciding, you know, what what is the best that we want to take for greater consistency. I think that would be helpful. Uh, although, you know, we are we are all very different, and um, what's right for TfL's level of reporting, um, and what's right for the GLA, uh, you know, we we are entirely different organisations. So I think that needs to be recognised as well. I understand the differences and the different scales, of course, but equally. It, it seems it could be sensible to have just something that is uh, has absolutely the same sort of things that you're monitoring, whether it's actual expenditure for the quarter budget, full year forecast, full year budget, some very simplistic things, but would help us understand each of it and others looking in. Is this something perhaps the GLA Group Collaboration Board should be looking into? Is this something that is being progressed? So, I mean, I'll pick up that as chair of the Group Collaboration Board. Okay. I, mean, I don't think it's specifically something that would fall in within the terms of reference of, of that board. But what I would say is, as I said earlier in the meeting, yeah, like we see there are improvements that can be made. That's why in the budget guidance we um, set out... Um, yeah, the information, the financial information we wanted to see each organisation provide, and I'm looking forward to seeing some changes there. As I say, Q1, the boat had sailed in terms of when the budget guidance was published, but I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing some changes when those reports come to me for Q2 um, to yeah to help help get some improvements there. Beyond that, there are more longer term conversations happening about performance reporting and yeah, absolutely agreeing with the idea of trying to, yeah, while, while recognising that each organisation is the same, there are clearly also touch points um, between them and things that they work together on and trying to say, well, yeah, how can we bring our performance reporting mm. together? Um, maybe you know, make it more, you know, more of a dynamic system to allow people to, to drill into it um, and you know, get a better understanding of the state of London and what is, you know, what is being done to um, you know, improve things. And so we, you know, we are engaged in some of those initial discussions at the moment. And so absolutely a kind of medium to longer term view is about how we try and you know, bring these together and get a system that gives us best practice across this area. That would be really helpful and help us in our work. And I, I am assured that we expect in the next quarter some more detail around the expenditure. And obviously, as you say, from next year, it should be automated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions um, about the performance outcomes and the dashboard. So looking at what is obviously, as the committee said, making sure that the programmes are on budget and on time, but what happens with the money and how we're delivering for Londoners. Um, and so, just in light of some of the missions that you've outlined, I um, appreciate not all of them are here, but um, I would really be interested in particular in how your work to support Londoners into good work um, is delivering. Um, there is a target there around, around that for 5,496 unemployed Londoners um, supported into work which in the dashboards is amber, and I'm just wondering what more needs to happen um, so that we can support those people, particularly in light of kind of coming out the pandemic and the um, universal credit cuts that are coming, um, how we can make sure that that happens and that target is achieved. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, 
I'm not going to be able to answer those in much detail mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if, if we're going to sort of um, dot around the dashboards. But in terms of the one that you, uh, you have mentioned, uh, as you're right, uh, it is currently amber at quarter one. Uh, and as the um, commentary at quarter one says, um, ambers reflect the impact of COVID-19 on skills and employment programmes especially with significantly reduced job and progression outcomes. Um, so uh, that's, that, was the, that was the state of play then. Um, you know, we've been talking about you know, some of the things that are happening in the economy uh, now, so I'm afraid I can't comment uh, now about what that's going to look like at quarter two, uh, because you know, we're only just, you know, we're not yet gathering those returns from teams. Okay. But, um, you know, there is a link to uh, the economy there. And so if we're beginning to see improvements there, we would expect to see uh, that beginning to improve. Okay. But I'm, so happy, I'm happy to get more detail in the Yeah, no, that helpful. would be really helpful to have that detail. Um, and I suppose the, the broad principles, because I, mean, I do have other questions about meeting those targets that are outlined underneath each of those recovery missions. Um, as Richard has said, that we expect that the manifesto commitments are deliverable on budget as things stand right now. Um, so I think it would be helpful to have an idea of the broad principles on how each of those missions are going to deliver in terms of targets on the ground, as it were. And that's probably one example. I suppose, um, maybe moving on, if that's okay, to think do, about... Do, do you mind if I... Come yes, back, of course. Call, that do you mind if I come back on that point, uh, Assembly Member? Because I think I think you're clear. I mean, the aim of the dashboards, in principle, is to give you that information at a glance. And as Mary said, they are a work in progress. You know, this is the first stab at them. I think we yep. all can see there's a work in progress, and we all can see that there are more performance metrics that need adding to this to aid to the picture. you you know, you, our partners, Londoners, and F and we get around the performance of the organisation. Uh, in doing that so hopefully the, the aim of the dashboards is to effectively to give you the questions you can then hold us the mayor deputy mayors and you know, eds accountable for across the whole suite of the gla's activities thank you and just one final question chair um i in the um performance reports there is kind of an overarching kind of narrative if you like around a lack of devolved powers um and i wonder if you could maybe think about the lack of a national environment strategy and um, kind of things as they are post Brexit um, and that, their impact on the green safety net mission in particular. Um, and just I'm wondering how you are working with the government to try and get those powers and that, those resources. You know, you mentioned previously in response to um, Assemblymember Polanski's question on buses about bringing that forward if you do have that funding, which has a really positive impact on air quality. But obviously on employment just wondering where you are with those conversations okay i think there's a broad and long-standing cross-party consensus amongst london's government that london doesn't have the powers it needs and certainly aren't equivalent to other world cities and you know this administration has wholly endorsed the results of the previous mayor's london finance commission has taken that work on and i think that sets out a sensible and you know well well thought through package of devolution measures that would significantly increase our ability to deliver for londoners and the ways in which Londoners can hold us to, to account. So those works, those conversations are carrying on. Uh, the mayor is trying to meet the new Secretary of State, uh, who part of his responsibilities are levelling up and part, and it's really interesting he's appointed Andy Haldane uh, to run a task force on levelling up, because Andy Haldane has been a radical devolutionist uh, in his career to date. We really welcome those appointments, and I think, to be honest, we think we welcome the appointment to the Secretary of State, who is a reputation of being both radical and thoughtful on these matters. So we are hopeful that there is an increased appetite in government, which there hasn't been over the last few years, for conversations about you know, revisiting, giving London the kind of cross-party consent, you know, revisiting the cross-party consensus. Let's not forget the mayor who commissioned the London Finance Commission is now in a relatively uh, senior position to be able to deliver for us. Assembly member Hirani. Thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the recovery missions and also uh, the remaining recovery missions uh, where performance dashboards haven't been published uh, around healthy food, healthy weight and mental health and well-being. Um, so what prevented them from being included in the Q1 report and has there been any funding allocated to it for 21-22? 
So I think the, um, the honest answer about why they didn't make the quarter one report is that you know, they are relying on the work of the health team in large part who have been you know, for months now pretty much entirely consumed on supporting a COVID response uh, and of course the um, uh, vaccination programme as well as it's, um, as it's developed. So you know, there's, uh, there's, there's ultimately an issue of capacity of some of these teams uh, at that point. So I took the view that uh, it was not really reasonable to ask them to turn around those dashboards while they were doing all of those other things. Um, they have, however, been allocated funding in our budget, um, um, fairly modest funding. I haven't got that on the top of my head, but they do have funding. Uh, and you'll see those dashboards come through at quarter two. Uh, if, if Assembly members are keen to understand more about those missions uh, before that, then I'm happy to facilitate some discussions with the team. Kia would be. I think th those of us also that sit on the health committee might may want to take that separately with, yes. with a different okay, committee. Yes, okay, fair enough. Um, will that result in? Uh, I mean, understandably, if, if the if the team are prioritising the COVID nineteen uh, response and recovery, will that lead to a delay in in timescales of implementing these particular recovery missions? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, uh, as the deputy chief of staff has said. You know, quite a lot of this work is in partnership with others, um, and uh, you know, as we know, you know, some of these health-related issues are absolute mayoral priorities as well. So, uh, as ever, as you know, as is true of most teams in this organisation, there's an awful lot of juggling going on at any one time to try and deliver against several different priorities. But you know, as 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 we know. Um, uh, you know, the, the progress of the virus is, you know, we're, we've had months working now with COVID uh, and we've had months working particularly with NHS colleagues on the vaccination programme. Um, I've also brought a restructure of the health team to the oversight committee in the last few months as well. And that too was, um, the whole objective of that was to, to allow the team to fulfil more of its broader responsibilities as well. So, you know, all of those things are feeding in now to to making the team uh, more able uh, to deliver across the breadth of work there. Can I give you one example from each mission, the kind of work that's going on at the moment? So on the uh, healthy food, healthy weight, one of the key elements of that was, was water only schools as an important public health initiative. You know, it, obviously very difficult to do that, to, to work in schools on that kind of issue during during the pandemic, and schools were closed for some of it. But the uh, but work on that is progressing. Our public health team are in touch with borough department, you know, directs of public health. And so, so although we haven't got the dashboard for you yet, for exactly the reasons that Mary set out, <coughs> the decision that Mary made, which I endorse, uh, that, you know, that work on that is still ongoing. Similarly, on the mental health mission, it was always envisioned that large parts of that would be delivered through the Thrive London campaign, uh, which the mayor and borough leaders have, have championed and is a really good bit of partnership working. And that, that again, goes on. Uh, it's really important. For example, we've been delivering bereavement counselling for families affected by COVID through through the Thrive London campaign. So it gives you a bit of a sense of the kind of the ongoing ongoing work of those uh, missions, even though the resource to produce dashboards in Q1 wasn't there. And I'm sure you would agree that if you have the choice between delivering bereavement counselling or delivering a, a dashboard, we know what's more important. So, so just on, on the setting of those performance indicators for the recovery missions, um, how confident are you that the targets are ambitious and, um, and can be met? For those particular ones or right across the... Just the recovery missions, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I believe them to be ambitious. I mean, it's always a balance, as you know, you know, we've got some very ambitious mayoral priorities to meet, and therefore the, uh, the measures in these dashboards must reflect that. Uh, in terms of our ability to meet them, um, you know, my job, the absolute crux of my job, is to make sure that as an organisation we have the, um, the, the capacity and the capability to meet those priorities. Now, that, that is a challenge in the financial climate. Uh, but um, 
you know, this, this set of quarter one dashboards that we're looking at, um, you know, are not entirely green, are they? I've got quite a lot of amber across these dashboards. And that's also because we do try and be very honest and realistic about where we are. So quite a lot of amber on um, capability, quite a lot of amber on time and uh, as well. And you know, b between reports, we're constantly reviewing that and talking to the teams about why that is and what we can do to support them to have the capacity and capability to deliver. So I am um, in expecting to see an improvement in some of these areas for quarter two. Um, it may well be in some areas that the green we've slipped back to amber. You know, it's a constant review and constant uh, job uh, to stay on top of it. But, you know, that's my job with the executive directors. So, to add to that, I the Mayor's absolutely right in what, what she says. If you take, for example, the Helping Good Londoners into Work mission that's already been referenced, and take, for example, off the top of my head, uh, performance indicator one about unemployed Londoners being supported into employment, and the target of, you know, give or take, five and a half thousand people to do with that. Performance of that against AMBER is AMBER for the re exact the reasons we've set out, that effectively quarter one was still during lock you know, some lockdown restrictions, and therefore the level of economic activity wasn't what any of us would have wanted it to be. Uh, and therefore, Amber, we need to keep a very close eye, eye on that. But in terms of the overall effectiveness of those programmes, the 5,500 people is a fair and realistic re reflection of what those programmes can do directly through some GLA service activity. But that's a relatively small part of the overall jobs recovery that the city needs coming out of the pandemic. And that's where the overall advocacy work is where the Let's Do London campaign is where the skills academies is where the work we're doing with boroughs to promote the CAS. So all the other work comes into play as well. And that's where David's work around a State of London report. So we get an overall impression of what's happening in London that's you know, related to the GLA's activities clearly, but is to a degree separate from it is really important as well. And we are, I think we are looking at how we bring out both what's going on directly as a result of the GLA's work, which is really important to monitor that the dashboards show, but also what's happening across the city uh, and how we reconcile the two, which is not, you know, not all, which is a, an interesting intellectual exercise actually, given you know how the shape of a city's economy is influenced. Yeah, so just on that five and a half thousand, and, and also I know there's a seven hundred and twenty. Uh, target for safeguarding jobs through the Good Growth Fund uh, as well. How how have you come to these figures and targets? Um, and j just bearing in mind your response to the the previous answer, um, where we feel that they're they're not that they're not reaching or they're not on course to reach targets. How how will you adjust? So the target so the targets have been developed by. Uh, service directors with, with accountable to deputy mayors that then go to be challenged by mayor and then go to be challenged by David, David and myself. Uh, so they are driven by effectively realistic, assumption, realistic assumptions about the scale of the individual programmes we're talking about here. Some of which, as you can see from these numbers, are, are valuable, but they're not very big. Uh, and I think the, but the, so that's where those come from and there is scrutiny uh, as part of this dashboard process and why these are useful about what's coming out. And you'll see as the quarters go, go on, you'll see more PIs added to this as I think the process that we've, we've set out. I mean, how that kind of, how we then try to catch up is, again, let's go back to unemployed London supported into, into employment. You then scrutinise, as we do through our own performance monitoring processes, why it's behind at the moment. There is a credible and simple reason, which is, you know, these targets were, were set assuming we didn't see wave two of COVID. We did, and therefore we were still in lockdown during uh, during some of the, that work. And there's a convincing thing, and therefore we're working as the uh, as the dash sheet, dashboards try to set out through the actions and the actions commentary on how we on how we catch up. So the aim of these dashboards is it gives you effectively the answer to those questions at a at a glance. They are a work in progress, but I think they're a, they're a genuine effort to. You know, be transparent about that kind of issue. Well, and the Q1 report states that there there are also data collection uh, issues as well, especially where you're relying on uh, on partners. 
and uh, I think the employment is, is, is a good example, really. But how are you addressing the issues raised in the Q1 performance reports, uh, such as the GLA being unable to provide data on the number of new jobs created or existing jobs safeguarded? So, um, because, because a lot of this work is done in conjunction with partners, we often um, struggle with data reporting, partly because of the timelines that people report to, and quite a lot of the adult education budget um, falls into that because it has its own reporting timelines. Um, again, um, uh, quarter one, of course, was you know, there'd been lockdown, there'd been partners unable to do some of the work they'd wanted to do. Um, certainly, um, some of the stuff that's reliant on further education, you know, the colleges had been shut. So again, there's a, a lot of COVID-related stuff that's feed, that fed some of the data issues, particularly related to quarter one, um, which I think has made, made that a, you know, an even more difficult quarter than normal. Um, I think we all find some of that very frustrating when we're in our own internal meetings about um, performance. I think you know, what I'm prepared to uh, also think about is that you know, if, we're, if we're still finding that a problem in quarter two, before we bring the quarter two dashboards to you, um, I can make sure that I highlight some of that in my covering report. I always try and highlight sort of the issues that we faced in my covering report to the assembly members with these reports. If data collection is, if we're still seeing a COVID-related impact on that in quarter two, I'll make that clear. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to learn about how you um, set or develop the targets working with partners as well, because uh, I think particularly on uh, on the recovery missions uh, targets that haven't been reported yet on, on healthy weight. Uh, I know in particular lo local authorities in, in my constituency have targets themselves on reducing childhood obesity, etc. So h how are you working uh, with local targets? It'll be the same for housing where they have their own housing delivery um, targets, which is which is sometimes different to what the, the GLA uh, want them to build as well. Uh, so, so do you have a? Uh, can you give me more insight into how you're working with local authorities in, in setting those targets as well? Um, I can't do that now, but I'm very happy to um, to do that subsequently in whichever way suits suits members best. I think it, it's a it's an important question to the target setting, definitely. I mean, some of these targets are set very, very simply because they are the outcomes that we have commissioned organisations to provide back to us in return for a set amount of money. So something as specific as, you know, 5496, to stick to the same example for, you know, my limited brain's capacity, uh, will be, you know, we've got a very specific number like that because that will be what we are now paying organisations to deliver through a, through a commissioning process. And uh, just, just want to finish with a comment if I if I may chair because I've heard it twice from answers in in this committee about schools and colleges being closed and uh, just just locally uh, we were always given uh, a, a a slap on the wrist uh, for saying that they were closed because over the pandemic they, they weren't remote. closed they were still you, open you are quite for, right yeah. yeah. consider that slap on the wrist taken <laughs> Never mind the, and anybody giving a slap on the wrist, quite happy with that. And I'm quite happy to say that you did change to a mission foundation-based budget, budget without good reason. And of course, that has made doing performance uh, reporting very much harder. And it's making it very much harder for us to try and keep note or, or, or scrutinise you on it which I'm sure was not the intention. But just one very final point. You brought it up, Richard, yourself. The Helping Londoners into Good Work mission. Um, you know it's showing the poorest level of progress with four out of five indicators as amber. Um, how confident are you that those targets will be met by the end of the year on that specific one? On that, well, of, of the specific PIs we've got at the moment, clearly there are two that are amber, but you're right, that has been extremely challenging. But as we talked about kind of informally, we're all really hopeful that the economy is picking up and to a degree we are, that will be driven by wider economic performance. But, so we, we are confident as, you know, we've got three quarters after these figures, but it is an area that, you know, we are 
keeping a very, very close watch on. And so we have to see the performance as it develops over the quarter. Over the next there are quarters. record levels of job vacancies. So I ask you again, how confident are you that those targets will be met by the end of the year? Well, I think very specific. Well, hold, hold on. This is where we start getting into the complexities of what's happening <laughs> in the wider economy versus what's happening in these particular programs. So you're not very you confident. That's not what I said, Chair. No. What, what are you saying? Are you confident? Are you not confident? Or have you no idea? No, we are confident that they will get hit. There are exactly right, challenges that the, 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 this, the dashboard sets out. And what I would add, Chair, is we are trying to openly and transparently set this information out. And I would encourage people to read the dashboard. Mm. Um, yes, it, 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 it is a very difficult thing to uh, follow. Um, because even as Mary said, you're doing your best shot at something new and, and it's not complete. But I think we'll stop there and we'll start again at, at, when we look at quarter two. So I would like to thank our guests for attending this morning and for their, for their answers to our questions. Can I ask the committee to note the report and the discussion? Noted. Thank you. Can, I also, uh, can we also delegate authority to me as chairman in consultation with the deputy chair and party group lead members to agree any output arising from this meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to note the quarterly monitoring reports? Noted. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to note the report? Noted. Uh, number nine. Can I ask the committee to note the mayor's decision lists? Noted. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to note the work programme? Noted. And the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for the 23rd of November 2021 at 10 a.m. in the chamber here. We hope here at the moment is here. Um, <laughs> I haven't been given notice of any other business, so I declare the meeting ended. Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair.